estimate that there'll be 30,000 kilometers a year of demand. Um, and there's currently only about five and a half thousand, six thousand kilometers of supply. And so we're building a cable factory up in the Northeast, um, massive sort of 900 million pound investment to actually supply the physical high voltage cables. Okay. Um, oh, and, these, these are all things new cables, I presume. Yeah, these are these are very big cables, uh, either under sea or or, or sort of mass, yeah. mass mass transport of electricity across the land. Um, and it's interesting. I mean, the industry the order books are completely full for the next five years. So we've had you know, all the national grids. So you know, well, I, had, I had one European national grid. Um, RTE, the French French National Grid, who are actually a small shareholder for full disclosure in Global Interconnection Group. So basically, could we take your output for the next 20 years, please? So um, nice conversation to have. Um, but it gives you an idea of just how much demand there is for the cables. Yeah. Okay. And then why, why is there that demand? Is because if you take the UK electricity market as a good example, um, when the wind is blowing, there's lots of power. When the wind's not blowing and the sun's not shining, there isn't. And therefore, you need to import, whether it be French nuclear power, Norwegian hydroelectric power, so or the uh, undersea cables to France and England. Yeah, exactly. And then there's undersea cable to Norway, and then we're building an undersea cable to Iceland to bring in geothermal power and hydroelectric power from Iceland. So um, massively important for grid security, energy security, because um, otherwise the lights go out. And well, the, the reason uh, I asked you- uh, Interesting, yeah. I'll tell you, the reason I asked you about Shetland this morning, uh, apart from the map where your arrow ran through, is I've got some windmills, or I mean, we have some windmills up in Shetland, and there's no interconnector to the grid, <laughs> which is absolutely crazy. Anyway, look, um, we've run over time. So let's thank you very much, well, Tom. Yeah, welcome, thank you. Welcome to everyone. As this conversation about uh, Atlantic Superconnectors was going on, I noticed we've got a large number of people on the call. It's very good to see you all. Thanks for turning up. And it's also very good to see Eddie Trull. Thanks to Eddie for turning up. He is, as you can see, in transit. He may be moving on and off trains during the course of this call, but nonetheless, we will persevere. So, Eddie, my first question to you is, where are you and what are you up to today? So I'm on a Swiss train and the good news is the Swiss have invested in their telecom network. So you get reasonably good signal, I hope, throughout the, throughout the journey. Um, I'm just off to see uh, Goldman Sachs, who um, are looking to invest into Global Interconnection Group, which we were just talking about. Um, and then I shall be whizzing my way over to London, not least for a uh, putative meeting with the pensions regulator on Thursday. So uh, looking forward to that. Excellent stuff. Um, do you want to explain uh, exactly what's happened to the pension super funds uh, and why you've mothballed it? Yes. So. Um, we had a very good response from the DWP back in, I think, 11th, 12th of July last year to their 2018 consultation on super funds. So, you know, it only took five or six years. Don't let's rush japs. Um, but the TPR have yet to embody the recommendations of the DWP into super fund guidance. And from an investor's point of view, and we're first and foremost a capital provider to backstop pensions, you've got to have clarity of outcomes. Clarity is the most important thing. It's more important than what those you know, rules actually say. You've got to be crystal clear. So number one, we need to have crystal clarity on what level of capital does one have to put up to backstop pensions. Secondly, we have to have crystal clarity on the ability to give investors, the investor capital, a return on that investor capital. 
and in our particular model, Clarity also, that we can pay out discretionary, what we call Christmas bonuses to our members at the same time. So and I've, I've been saying this to anybody who wants to listen, is that if you expect to attract external capital, and we've got several billion of international capital lined up to come in to help support the UK's pension system, you have to give them clarity that if the uh, investments you know, perform um, and go up, that the investors will get a return on their capital and that they can, with certainty, receive that return. And if you don't give them that clarity, guess what? They're not going to invest. Um, we've got hundreds of investments they can select and going into a situation of regulatory uncertainty doesn't doesn't attract any capital at all. And so unless and until we get that crystal clarity, um, you know, stop asking the same question and expecting a different answer. OK, well, you've moved on. Um, and I think you're now working on capital back journey plans. Uh, can you explain how these work and what sort of advantages they bring to the to the population and why you're doing it? What, what's in it for you? Yeah, well, that's always a good question. What's in it for us? Um, so the capital back journey plan is where one either joins in as a co-sponsor or takes over the sponsorship of a defined benefit pension plan. So I, most, I know sure most of the audience know this already. Um, and I, my time, have backstopped about eight billion pounds worth of pensions in this way. Um, so, for example, one of the first deals we did was Thresher's The Wine Merchants, which some of you may have um, frequented whilst being students. And we took over the uh, we took over a rather troubled, to put it nicely, um, wine merchant, uh, became the sponsor, and put up capital to backstop the pension fund. So the members would otherwise have gone into the pension protection fund because the wine merchant went bust uh, and would have had a haircut to their pensions, as you all know. Instead, we put up, um, in that particular case, about £15 million of backstop capital over and above the assets in the pension fund. And that gave the trustees a high degree of certainty that the pensions would be paid in full. Off we then went on our journey, and I've done this a dozen or more times. Um, they mostly began with T, so Thresher's, Thorn, Talent, though the Wolf and Stowe Dog Stadium also made it onto the list, um, perhaps not quite as big as Talent at four billion. So you go off on your journey, and over time you work with the trustees to firstly hedge the unrewarded risks, interest rates, inflation, and we pioneered the hedging of longevity risk. And we can make that longevity risk hedging available to relatively small pension funds as well. Then you know with certainty where you are for the next 30, 40, 50 years on the outflows. And at that point, you can then work with the trustees to uh, appropriately allocate the pension assets. And our base case model is that we'd have 75, 80% in what we call bedrock, so high-grade corporate bonds, uh, liquid bonds to support the uh, hedging, and 20 25% in private market assets. And uh, whilst everybody thinks this idea just only came about in the Mansion House reforms, in fact, one's been doing it for, for many, many years, um, and the private market assets provide the long-term returns that enable that outperformance that I was referring to earlier. We put this into practice for the capital back funding arrangements. We also put this into practice when Luke Webster and I took over the running of the London Pension Fund Authority. And depending on the credit strength of your sponsors, you've either got a capital financial guarantee, which effectively gives you 99% certainty of outcome, or you might have a very strong sponsor like London, pretty undoubted credit. That enables you to flex your 
allocation to private markets. So whilst for a financially backed, capital backed funding arrangement, we typically put 20, 25% uh, recommendation to the trustees for private market assets. In the case of London, we put 45% into private markets and we doubled the pension fund in seven years. So something went well. That return on the private market asset portfolio, which is widely diversified across infrastructure, private equity, property, and so on, actually provides an overall return. And we typically hope that the pension fund would make one and a half to two percent above above gilts um, across the portfolio. That two percent for sake of argument above above gilts and you need to, uh, would then be shared between the investors who put up the backstop capital and the members. Um, so each year we do the calculation that two percent of outperformance would uh, would be split in, in in a fair proportion between investors and paying people a Christmas bonus. Thanks very much for that, Eddie. Um, I should say to anyone who's on the call, put your hand up digitally if you want to ask any questions at any stages. I'm going to ask a few more questions of Eddie as we go along, but don't worry about interrupting me or indeed any uh, point of the call is to try and get as much out of it as you can, as well as um, give any opportunity to explain what's going on in the world of pension super funds. Um, OK, the, the third thing which I'm very interested in is the work you're doing trying to help DC members turn their pots to pensions. Um, can you explain a little bit about pension super haven? Yes, indeed. So this uh, the genesis of this idea was us, with the great help of, of Henry and Steve and, and others, trying to help come up with a solution for the hapless British Steel or ex-British Steel pension fund members, seven, eight thousand of them, who were transferred inappropriately out of the British Steel defined benefit pension scheme, and we've got sort of personal pension pots plus or minus uh, some restitution from the uh, Financial Services Compensation Scheme for being inappropriately transferred out. What we believe those members, those people want is basically a pension for life. If they have a pension for life that's, that's absolutely certain, and on top the opportunity to make my famous Christmas bonus, then they're in a very good position because they've got a lifetime pension. It doesn't matter whether they live to 80 or 105, they get their pension for life, 99% certainty of being paid. They're still a member of the Pension Protection Fund. So uh, in the that sort of extremely unlikely event that uh, for whatever reason, the pension didn't get paid in full, then they can um, have the safety of the PPF, which I think is probably rather better than the financial services compensation scheme, and off they go. Where we've uh, moved can, can, sorry. Couldn't you get this from an annuity though, Eddie? I mean, is, are there financial advantages to doing it this way rather than buying an annuity? You can always buy an annuity uh, if you wish. Um, firstly, on the calculations that we've come up with, you'd probably get 10, 15% more pension, certain pension, than you would get from an annuity. So instead of getting £9,000 a year, you get £10,000 a year or whatever it is. Secondly, you've got this opportunity to share in the outcomes. Well, in the old fashioned words, a with profits annuity, but done properly. So um, you've got with profits, certain pension. And we think that shared outcomes is very important. Um, and then also you can do this on a deferred basis so that you could be 40 years old and decide to essentially put some money aside um, either as a single lump sum or a regular contribution to essentially buy yourself a pension a bit like making a contribution to a standard occupational pension scheme and that is exactly what this is this is a standard occupational pension scheme into which members can, can contribute 
um, transfer in their their current DC pension pot. So you move your DC pension pot across uh, and actually get a guaranteed you know, certain outcome. Excellent stuff. Um, and when are you expecting this will be available to the general public, Eddie? So we're working hard on it. Um, and we've spent a year and a half, two years with regulators in particular, socializing all of this. Um, I think it has been uh, well received by, by the regulatory world. I mean, after all, it's a standard occupational pension scheme, so there's nothing new about it. Um, won't surprise you that the insurance lobby has sort of tried to brief against it. Um, I haven't actually come up with any good reasons so far. But um, we're just going to keep pressing on. So what we're making sure is that we're putting in place, with the help of people like like Age Wage, the, the proper front end advice. And it's really, really important that um, pensioners thinking of transferring across have got very clear, transparent comparisons. So you raised they buy an annuity. Well, how much would you get from an annuity? So go and get an annuity quote. How much would you get from pension super haven? Get the pension super haven quote. And then you can Let's hope that Eddie comes out of a tunnel soon. If I can just continue on that. You got you there, Eddie? Yes, I'm here. Good. Um, we missed it. We missed about 20 seconds of you there, Eddie. So if you'd like to continue from where you left off. Okay. So what I was saying is we want to put in place also the opportunity for members to supply their own medical details. And if they are not in very good health, then hopefully they will be able to get a certain pension at a higher level, an enhanced pension. And uh, we're doing that in conjunction with uh, Hanover Reef. I've worked with Hanover Reef for about 15 years. Um, we did the first big longevity risk reinsurances with them back in the uh, Pension Insurance Corporation days. And Wolf Becker, who was chief executive uh, of, of Hanover Reef's life operations, is still very much uh, involved with us, uh, even in the 70s. So he's proving that uh, longevity risk can work both ways. Great stuff. OK, uh, so we've done a whistle stop tour around capital back journeys and the uh, pension superhaven, which is, I guess, a capital back journey in itself. Would that be fair to say? Well, it's capital backed and it's a journey for life. So, um, you know, it's uh, as they say, a journey of a thousand miles starts with a single step. So the single step is to uh, get onto pension superhaven's platform, uh, which should be ready in the next six weeks or so and uh, see whether you want to go on a thousand mile journey. A retail capital back journey for anyone who's got a DC pot sounds exciting. OK, uh, well, to complete that whistle stop tour, we started by talking just before we we uh, we came on live about some of the work you're doing with disruptive capital. Um, and perhaps you could talk a little bit about ways of getting your private equity to market, as well as talking about what kind of things you'd like to do as a private equity manager? Thank you. Well, we set up <clears throat> my late brother Danny, who was chief investment officer at Wellcome Trust and then at CIA and then at uh, Pension Insurance Corporation. Um, and I set up a charity called True Conservation Foundation in 2005. And our aim was to make money for charity by being good underlined investors. So everything we've been investing in since since then has been positive impact and not just E, but S and G as well. Um, so we've got a long heritage there. And actually, I started in 1984 uh, in private equity. So um, I have an even longer heritage there. And it's been a successful journey. Um, managed to make about 29 percent per annum over 30 years. Obviously, some downs as well as ups along the way, but it's been it's been a wonderful journey. What we're looking to do and, and have been doing out of uh, Disruptive Capital, which is this charity owned uh, investment manager, is to 
first of all, create a company to address a much to, to address a market need, a long term market need. So we were using it's now Global Interconnection Group as a good example. So you know, 10 years ago, one could see that nuclear power was was going to fade out. One could see that fossil fuel gener electricity generation was bad for the climate and that one needed to address the looming energy crisis. So we put an excellent management team together and we started to address that by starting work on the uh, all the feasibility studies and so on to build these massive interconnector cables to bring clean power, zero carbon power to the UK when required. I'm just using this as an example of what we do. Um, and I've done, in, I'm now my 45th platform investment. So, uh, you know, it's across quite a number of different sectors, healthcare and so on as well. And then you buy, build and transform. And over the decades, I've always wanted to back superb management teams to create market leaders, both by building and also by acquisition so that one creates market leaders. So uh, in the retail world, you'll know about Wix, for example. In healthcare, we finished up running 220 homes for very challenged people, about 40% of the UK uh, customers uh, with severe mental and physical needs, and so it goes on. And then build, drive that to market leadership, I define market leadership by being investigated by the antitrust authorities. I think I've had 11 monopolist commission investigations in the UK and two European commission ones. So uh, one has definitely created market leaders, let's put it that way. So, And then one's creating strategic value and off we go. So this philosophy has been carried across into pension fund investments, for example, working with, with my colleagues at, uh, at London Pension Fund and assiduously you know working with government to try to point out how private market investment can be very beneficial for pension outcomes in the long run and certainly if you look at the canadians australians or whatever you know they've managed to make double digit returns over 20 years and produce much better pension outcomes for their pensioners so we've created something called Long-Term Assets 2 um, as an insurance-wrapped vehicle because the CIOs, particularly the DC funds and the DC master trusts, felt it's much easier to invest via an insurance wrapper. Properly diversified, glittering array of sub-managers in the different asset, sort of sub-asset classes, infrastructure, private equity, and so on. And um, we are hoping to use that low cost, well managed vehicle to deliver on the mansion house reforms to, to pension funds and pension savers. OK, so not perhaps what many people were expecting, uh, an LTAF. I'm not that keen on LTAFs. I mean, there was obviously we actually we actually created Long Term Assets Limited, so um, I could probably uh, sue the FCA for passing off, but uh, life is too short. Um, but there was features around the LTAF structure that, to me, are highly reminiscent of the the property vehicles that sort of have to blow up and get get sort of gated every three or four years um and, and i don't think the design of the ltas has really taken that into account okay thanks very much and and the, the other vehicle of course which you could be using is a good old-fashioned investment company have you looked at that we certainly have um and it's i mean i was on a seminar with the stock exchange and various other people a couple of weeks ago and the problem is the stock exchange can't get its tiny mind around around investment you know investment companies being put on the market where the underlying investments change every week um so uh you know they, they really struggled to um 
to list uh, long-term assets. One. Secondly, um, as we all know, investment trusts are trading at a significant discount uh, in the main. So, uh, you know, 20, 30 percent discounts. And we would generally prefer to uh, buy investment trusts rather than sell investment trusts. So certainly one of the target targets that we have in mind for long-term assets too is actually to acquire um, well-managed investment trusts at significant discounts and therefore get quite a nice little pop for our uh, for our investors and uh, you may see a consolidation theme throughout everything we're doing but if you look at renewable energy for example there are 18 investment trusts which is just ridiculous okay I'm going to move on now, Eddie, if I may, to a couple of questions which have come in um, from on the chat. But first, I'm going to deal with two questions uh, coming from Bobby and from Matthew. First of all, Bobby, do you want to ask your question? Take yourself off mute. Yeah, so um, I'm assuming the protection you've got against being dragged into insurance legislation is the Occupational Pension Scheme wrapper. And have you had any discussions or thoughts about if this is successful and starts producing guaranteed returns, if there's a if there's a chance that the regulators or even the politicians might say, oh, this is really, really successful, why shouldn't this be the same as annuity? And why shouldn't it be subject to the same annuity matching restrictions on investments, which would obviously then decimate the return? Uh, you're talking about Pedro Superhaven here, yeah? Yes, yes. Okay. Eddie. So first of all, it is an occupational pension scheme. And obviously, if, if government wishes to um, dispense with occupational pension schemes, then that's the will of government. But in the meantime, it's exactly the same as you know, joining the Marks and Spencer's pension scheme or any other pension scheme. Um, secondly, in terms of capital regime, whilst under Solvency 2, and don't forget I was chief executive of Pension Insurance Corporation, so I have a, a passing familiarity with insurance regs, um, you are heavily penalised for investing into, for example, um, infrastructure equity. Uh, nonetheless, you do get the benefit of so-called matching adjustments. And in fact, on our comparators, we think Pension Superhaven would enjoy at least as good capital backing as an insurance company. So we're providing at least as good uh, certainty of, in, of uh, members being paid uh, in full. And um in in some calculations even better than insurance companies so uh you've got the safety and security of an insurance company if you think insurance companies are safe and secure um but the flexibility particularly from an investment point of view of an occupational pension scheme okay so i think the, the advantage you're coming from here from the side of risk into this rather than property patient pension scheme if insurance companies which are coming from a risk zero position. I used to be with Profit Act, I used to do DTI returns, so and some of those regulations as well. So yeah, thanks for that answer. Okay, um, thanks very much, Bobby. Moving on to Matthew, and I see Bob's got a call in, uh, a, a hand up too, then I'm going to come to the calls in the chat. So Matthew, you want to take yourself off mute? Yep, hopefully you can hear me. Yep, can hear you. Uh, so yeah, there's also a question on the pension superhaven. Um, so I think I, I presume, having not looked at uh, the rates of annuity purchase over the past couple of years, I can wholly imagine it's gone up as annuity rates have got a lot better. But is there still a demand for individuals purchasing annuities? I think um, I can answer that in part by saying that the latest FCA statistics still showing about 10% of all decisions that are taken are taken in favour of annuities rather than drawdown. Um, but uh, th that's incomplete information. Uh, so there is some demand there. Eddie? Yeah, I mean, I think what we're seeing is that particularly after the advent of pension freedoms, people want to be able to benefit from flexibility, particularly before they retire. Um, so, you know, not make the irrevocable decision that buying an annuity is. Uh, secondly, they want to continue to participate um, in the investment market rather than buying what is effectively a fixed guilt. And therefore, you know, if Henry says 10%, it's probably about right. Um, 
90% of people don't want annuity. We should add that the scheme pension itself is an irre irrevocable pension. So splitting your money between a scheme pension and drawdown in cash is the way forward. Uh, but obviously there is demand for guaranteed income out there. We, we think probably more so. Um, I, 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 ha I have to use the word we here and declare an interest because I do help with the marketing of PSH, as most of you know. Um, I'm going to move on. Does that answer your question, Matthew? Yep, yeah, that's grand. Thank you. Uh, Bob. I'm muted. Um, Eddie, Bob Compton here. Quick question for you on Pension Superhaven, which I think is a great idea, by the way. Um, it's an occupational pension scheme. How do you get around the issue that anybody with a DC pot transferring in needs to be an employee of the Pension Superhaven, pension superhaven Company? How do you get around that problem? Yeah, so we spent a lot of time on that one. And, um, you know, we're, we're, we won't be having sort of 300,000 employees, you'd be pleased to hear, for more than about, uh, for more than about a week. So um, it's, uh, you know, you, you can be a, a very um, gentle employee, let's put it that way. Okay. Yeah. The trustee and rules, uh, Bob, does allow people to make a contribution without physically having to be paid. Okay. Excellent. Um, okay, I'm going to move to one or two questions. Unless somebody wants to open their gob now, put their hand up and have a, have a conversation. No? Okay. Um, so Bob's question has already been answered. Um, the question for Nicola. Do you want to ask that in person, Nicola? Or would you like to ask it for you? I'll ask it for you, Nicola, unless you come in as I speak. Um, it sounds almost perfect, she says. Why has no one else thought of this? What are the risks associated? And is there anything new in terms of risk with this solution? OK. I, sorry, I've just read it to the end of your question now, Nicola. So yes, of course, I will ask your question for you. Why has nobody else done this before, Eddie? I, I don't know. I mean, I, what I try to do, uh, always try to do, is, is, is look at the market problem sort of as, as objectively as possible. And, you know, there's been an enormous thrust over the last decade, moving people out of DB and, and creating all sorts of uh, DC type of options for people. Um, and certainly, you know, the DB pension promise is remarkably expensive. And I suspect there's been a bit of a almost ideological aversion to the word defined benefit. Um, in the minds of employers in particular. And so, uh, you know, the baby has been thrown out with the bathwater, in my opinion, because I suspect many people actually want the certainty of knowing they've got a pension for life for however long they live. And that's what the DB promise was, or is in some cases, particularly in the public sector. And that's what people want. OK. Um... Peter, do you want to ask your question in person or shall I ask it for you? I, if you can hear me, I'll yeah. ask it in person. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Basically, I understand that from what you were saying that the Christmas bonus is calculated and paid each year. And in terms of your past experience, how large have they been in relation to the annual pension? And is there any attempt to smooth them out over the years? So no smoothing. Um, and it's not guaranteed. So, you know, it only gets paid if the uh, if there has actually been the performance over the year. Um, our calculations would on average suggest it would be a 13th check. That's probably the best way of thinking about it. So you get another 7% or something like that on top of your existing pension. So that's, that's the sort of experience that we would uh, hope to replicate. I could just ask a quick follow up question and that's maybe more for Henry. How do you market these through? Uh, um, because presumably IFAs have a problem with this. I, I wouldn't expect IFAs to have a problem with this other than uh, under the consumer duty, they'd almost certainly be required to uh, promote this as an option. I remember as an IFA in the 90s, 
having to present uh, the option of a scheme pension if a member was a uh, if somebody was a member of say the Unilever pension scheme they would almost certainly get a, a 10 for one offer there from the scheme actually uh, and and the trustees so I expect that will continue to be the case now the question is how do you present all these choices to your clients as an advisor uh, and here I think we're going to increasingly see platforms of choice are uh, coming into play. Uh, Eddie mentioned age wage. This is something which we're very interested in doing, hosting choices on a platform, helping people with those choices through what's called targeted support, and perhaps using an algorithm which enables people to understand what other people like them have been doing with their money. That's something that you develop over time using AI and so on. So a sort of uh, an answer to that question is, by adopting every means at your disposal to help people make informed choice about the disposal of their money at the point in which they decide they're going to convert from being potholders to pensioners. Does that answer your question properly? Yes, it does. Thank you very much. And thank you. Thank Eddie. you. Thank, thank you. Um, could I could I also just add yes. to that one? We would not accept unadvised uh, contributions. Um, People have got to, got, to, got to go through the advice uh, process or alternatively come in via, for example, um, a DC pension uh, platform. Yeah, so um, we accept that the burden of responsibility is on us and that we would like to be offering a service which both the pension regulator and the FCA would see as compliance. Uh, great. Lots of questions um, in the chat. Um, John Matter has asked me to ask a question on his behalf. Is that okay with John? Put your thumb up. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the flip side of electrical supply is to have a product which lowers demand. An EIS that I invested in uses photons rather than electrons in computing. One practical application would, would reduce server warehouses' energy demand by up to 80 or oh, more than 80%. How would we locate a thinking venture capitalist for the next rounds? So what advice can you give to John about getting venture capitalists involved in his venture? That perhaps is a, a leading question. So there's quite a lot in my sort of venture capital experience, there's quite a lot of money around for relatively small checks, sort of one to five million. Uh, EIS is an excellent route and there's some good sort of EIS managers around, and I recommend you start with those. Where we found a big gap in the market is if you want 20 or 30 million, it's sort of too big for the venture capital community in the UK, um, and the companies aren't well enough developed to really attract the private equity companies. So that is a big gap there. In certain sectors, particularly life sciences, um, we're working with people like uh, Kate Bingham's SV Life Sciences. They are very much the sort of sector champion in that area and can write. They've got uh, several billion under management. We're hoping to add to that uh, fund pot and they can actually um, invest 20, 30 million into the next round of development of a company. Um, on the technology side, uh, we're good friends with Anne Glover's Amadeus. Um, what I would describe as a deep, deep tech venture capitalist. And we'd be delighted to introduce you to Amadeus if, if, uh, if that's the sort of uh, route you'd like to go. John, I'll put you in touch with Eddie. Thanks very much for that. Bob, you've still got your hand up. Is, have you got another question or can we pass you by? I'm going pass to pass you by if that's the case. Thank you. Um, let's move on to Stephen Wright. Stephen, nice to see you on the call. Stephen, you're on mute at the moment. I beg your pardon. I was trying to keep out of the, the discussion. Uh, yeah, um, I was wondering a sort of different perspective on what you're talking about with these with various super funds and platforms. Um, uh, making pension promises is just a form of gearing. It's, uh, you know, you're making long-term commitments at, at, at a fixed rate. You're making risk-free promises. 
Uh, and then, uh, you know, you're hoping to make money by investing in, in higher yielding assets, which is just a form of financial intermediation. That, you know, that's a I mean, on paper, it sounds like a, 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 a nice, plausible story. I suppose what will be reassuring, I think, to sort of people looking at it from the outside, it is a form of gearing. And you could relatively easily calculate the implied market value of the liabilities, which are the pensions, treating them as essentially as annuities. Uh, and do a, uh, you could probably just about, uh, you know, private equity, of course, getting a true market value of the private equity is always a bit problematic. It's one of the traps of private equity. Nonetheless, you could make a market valuation. I'd be curious to know what level of gearing we are actually talking about in these kind of platforms. Um, I mean, you know, if it's relatively low, it's therefore the debts are pretty well secured, then everyone will be reassured. Um, but, you know, there are some slightly disconcerting parallels with banks. Or, dis or indeed disconcerting parallels with insurance companies. Yeah. So <laughs> let me use my sort of insurance company experience. Um, an insurance company typically has, if, if you call the, the present value of the liability discounted at a uh, conservative you know, gilts plus a little bit rate as 100 an insurance company typically has about 90 to 95 of tangible assets backing that promise to pay 100. It then, by wonderful voodoo economics of matching adjustments, discounts its expected returns for the next 20 years and claims that's capital, yep. so-called matching adjustment. And so that is highly geared in the sense that your solvency capital is um, in large part made up of, frankly, a discount of what you think you're going to make for 20 years time rather than real cash. And so it's a highly geared operation. Um, and the gearing ratios will vary, but if you think of the hard cash that we actually put into Pension Insurance Corporation over the years, that's about two billion plus or minus of equity. And that's supporting about 50 billion of essentially pension promises. So that's pretty racy gearing in my book. Um, under the Pension Superfund Capital construct, um, the gearing ratio is more like seven or eight times than 20 times or 30 times in that we would typically put up, as I say, seven sort of seven pounds of uh, equity. We'd um, increase that with real cash contributions from the old employer. I'm, I'm talking about a sort of um, solvent capital back journey plan, for example, or super fund. Um, so you'd have about 15 of real cash backing 100 of pension promises. Does that answer your question, Stephen? Well, yeah, it, it answers my question. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I'd have to go back and think about those numbers. I mean, that's, you know, I mean, it's, you know, the, 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 the global financial crisis arose from excessive levels of gearing. I think, you know, what people are always entitled to be concerned about gearing and, and look at the look at the numbers. I, you know, it, it, it's a heavily geared operation, as you as you say, so insurance companies. Uh, I mean, the, I, I don't know what the default rate has been on annuities over the years. I don't think it's been especially high. So somehow that system seems to work. Uh, this is a new system. And so I suppose one would want to be a, a little wary of it. But um, it, it's an interesting I'm, I'm, it's, I'm interested to hear the response. It's nice to hear a number or two rather than just a discussion of broad principles. Thank you. Thanks. OK, John, I, I'm going to move on to you and then I'll come to Bryn and Les. Matthew, you've got a very urgent question, or is that just your old hand up? Uh, I, I did have a new question, but I'm happy to go last. OK, you're going to go last on that. All right. John. Good morning. Morning. Thank you. Um, I was going to ask you, Eddie, about what your thoughts on sponsors that can afford a, and schemes that can afford a BPA um, um, about purchase annuity actually transacting. But uh, you may have already given us your view, um, but you'd like to answer that in a second. My second question is a bit more punchy, which is, um, you know, what would you say to the challenge that it's not really an occupational scheme, there's a bum swerve going on there, and it is, there's certainty but no guarantees, and it's PPF, not FSCS, and it's retail, not institutional? 
your, your, your pension super haven. Yeah, so many commentators would regard the PPF as a better safety net than the financial services compensation scheme. But uh, there are many experts in this room, so I would hesitate to uh, be too definitive about that. Um, so I think the, the safety net is probably stronger. Uh, it is at least funded, which is a good start. Um, in terms of the uh, BPA side of things, many sort of corporate finance directors that I've been talking to are wondering why they're giving not only the surplus in their pension fund, but also typically a significant top up, a risk transfer premium from the employer as well. And don't forget, I mean, I've done about 100 of those deals on the other side. So I'm, I'm being a little bit uh, hypocritical now, um, criticizing the BPA market. But um, let's say it's on average 115, 120% of, of technical provisions of liabilities. You know, that is a big transfer from the pensioners and from the corporates to the insurance company's shareholders. Um, I would like to suggest there's a better way, which is to work with people like ourselves to say, right, um, firstly, it might cost you less to start with. Secondly, to the extent there's surpluses to be shared, then we could actually share those with the members or in some cases, even the corporate um, in, a, in an efficient way so that Actually, the stakeholders have got a very reasonable prospect of getting uh, improvements in their pension outcomes, improvements in their corporate balance sheet at a lower cost uh, than they would otherwise be having to pay to just transfer it to an insurance company. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm going to move on, uh, if I may, John, because I know you've probably got more questions. I'd like to get to Bryn and, uh, and then circulate round to Chris and so on. Um, Bryn. Yes, um, I must apologise for coming late. Secondly, if this is a poor poor connection, tell me if this is poor. It's fine, we can hear you fine. fine. Yeah. Um, well, I was late in, so uh, the issue may have been raised. Um, but it it's uh, the, the problem with uh, pension scheme buyouts is the, is the loss of, from, from my perspective, is the loss of the members' reasonable expectations. It's just gone. Whatever, uh, there's a chance that in the buyout there's someone there arguing on behalf of the members, but I'm uh, not totally convinced that. Uh, as as um, uh, Eddie has set out his pitch, there's 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 some continuation of the members' reasonable expectations, and and that's obviously good. What I wasn't clear about at some stage, and I wasn't clear at the time, um, there was a um, an analogy with with profits, uh, but then uh, we we were told that there's no smoothing. I was a bit confused by that. And I think paying out profits and uh, Christmas bonuses, it, 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 it's still going to be based on some sort of future assessment of what's what's required. So it, it, the, the difference between that and smoothing and with profits is, is all um, to a certain extent um, notional. The, uh, I assume this is an issue which, which, which has been well discussed. I'd just be be interested in any co comments about quite how you separate out the those those different issues in this in this proposal. Yes. So, so first and foremost, you've got to make sure that the capital backing is at least as big as. As, 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 as demanded by the regulator, 99% certainty. You then have an extra buffer on the buffer. So let's say you go from 99% certainty over one year to 99% certainty over five years, as an example. Um, and then you only pay out profit above that level. 
um, so you're safe and secure. Then you're sharing the sharing the positive outcomes. And we've looked at smoothing, but we the problem with smoothing is is I think you get a lot of intergenerational unfairness with smoothing. I mean, if you happen to be around at the end of the game, your quid's in. But okay. along along the way, people may die or move on, and they won't have got the full benefit of the outperformance. And therefore, it's a bit of a tontine in some ways. Um, and we don't think that's a we don't think that's fair. But I mean, I welcome I welcome your your views on that. Brendan, do you want to come back on that? Yeah. Yes. I I think that technically, I don't think there's a difference in principle between smoothing and having safe reserves. Ultimately, they're they're the same thing. Um, particularly if you're paying out money into them, the difficulty comes when when people want to take their money out pre pre retirement. Uh, again, you have to take a a view as to what the members' share is at that point, uh, and there's. I, I, I don't accept that there's that clear a distinction. You're saying you're not doing smoothing, but you are doing substantial profits. And it's, mm -hmm. it's uh, I think, ultimately well, the same thing, aren't they? Possibly. I mean, what we, I mean, the world's moved from, I mean, when I, I, I was first appointed as director of the bank, we didn't, we, we were allowed to have hidden reserves. We didn't have to actually mm. declare to the market or the regulator, what well, we did to the regulator, but not to the market, what um, what our profits actually were. We just made them up. And the with profits regime was not dissimilar. Uh, in today's world, you know, basically it's all marked to market if you, if, you, if you take that analogy. So we know exactly what the, uh, the assets are. And on the liability side, we use market um curves so for example the you know the future curve for interest rates to discount liabilities rather than again sort of making it up when i started out in the pensions world 15 years ago you know, some of the uh, actuaries in my firm were saying well you know we don't we don't like the uh, market forecast of inflation we prefer to use two and a half percent and I said, well, that's fascinating. But if, if the market thinks inflation is going to be 3%, then that's the number as far as we're concerned. So we use the actual market numbers rather than, rather than you know, hoping that inflation might always be a particularly fixed number. Does that help, Bryn? And can I move on or do you want to come back on that? No, that's fine. That's fine. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. For in which, in which case, I'll move on to Chris, because Chris Giles, I think you had a question. Do you want to take yourself off mute? Yes, thanks, Henry. Eddie, could PSH remove the cliff edge of pot conversion by allowing people to join, say, 10 years before they actually draw their pension and managing their fund in the pre-retirement period? Absolutely. So you could join at you know, 40 or 50, um, <clears throat> make your contribution. And you know, you put in your hundred, as you might say, and know that you're going to get ten a pension or whatever the number is. And so you know, you know what your pension is going to be, um, irrespective of whether markets go up or down at the moment that you happen to retire. Right. So you would be managing the money and managing their expectations in that pre-retirement period. Correct. So as if, say, a 50-year-old transfers his or her pension across, they then know at the age of 50 that when they get to retirement at 65 or whatever it is, then they are going to get a, a, a defined benefit pension, if I can use that analogy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK. Yeah, um, I, could just, I was just going to say, because I think that is the real problem with DC, is, is to eliminate the pot conversion uh single point of uh of risk and if we can do yeah. that then that's definitely a move in the right direction 
This was not a sponsored question, Tris. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Matthew, Matthew, you did have another question and we have got time to come to it. So thank you for that. You're still on mute, by the way. I think I might have re-muted myself. Thank you. Um, so yes, just another question on the on the pension superhaven. Um, thinking about where the sort of demand's going to come from. So of those, the ten percent of, uh, of of retirees who purchase an annuity, I can see that a lot of those would be DB members, say, who are forced to speak to a, an advisor and get some advice before they do anything with their their pension, and then the advisor has to tell them about annuities, and they say, oh, actually, that's quite a good idea, and I'll go and do that, which isn't something that would occur in the DC world because I don't think there's any obligation if you've got a 30 grand or 50 grand DC pot to to get any financial advice and so you might never hear about such a service uh, and similarly it might not be something that uh, pension plans have in place where you speak to a financial advisor if it's a DC DC pot so I was just wondering if you have spoken to large IFA firms seen what they think uh, is this on their radar is it the kind of thing they'd be happy to recommend and the kind of thing that they would want to know more information about? And similarly, if you've spoken to pension plan providers themselves or or consultants about how this additional option might uh, might go alongside the traditional retirement options. Indeed. So on the IFA side, in another part of the forest, we're taking over a business called STM has about seven point seven billion pounds of pension savings. Uh, all sorts of wrappers, you know, SIPs and SASs and master trusts and all sorts of stuff. And certainly they're very interested in this. And the big IFA providers of uh, clients are also extremely interested in this. I was on a call with one of them the other day, um, big master trust. And, you know, it was interesting. Somehow the... Uh, CIO had learnt about uh, pension superhaven. He said, "Have you got another 15 minutes?" I said, "We've got billions of pounds under management. I've got as much time as you like." And he said, "I need 15 minutes with you on pension superhaven because it's just the sort of thing we think we should be offering to our members as one of the options, both pre and post return." And so, I think in many ways, from a distribution point of view, we will stand on other people's shoulders. Um, master Trust would be a good example, but also on the corporate side, to your second question, um, we have been gently having conversations with large corporate uh, pension fund managers um, for their DC pots, and they seem to be very interested, again, in offering this as a choice. And I would emphasize it's not, it's not all or nothing. You could take some pension superhaven, certain pension, and you could you know, run some of your pot um, uh, as you see fit. So it's it's not a it's not a sort of single decision that you have to take at any one particular point in time. You could do slices over time. Thanks very much. Thank you. Does that that answer your question, Matthew? It does. Good. Um, Steve Goddard, you had a question, and then I think we may actually have one time for one more after that. Steve, what were you going to ask? Yeah, we had a session, as many of you remember, with Aaron Muralidar uh, of the World Bank talking about selfies. Uh, it sounds a little bit like selfies, Eddie, um, which is sort of idea of buying corporate bonds. Um, so how would Pension Superhaven compare to that? Does it sound, I think, does it sound better than that? It's, your option is, a, is for life, isn't it, presumably? Well, interestingly, uh, I'm a member of the OECD's Long-Term Investment Council. And we've done a lot of long-term cuts of investment portfolios versus pension outcomes. And I can say over a long period, 100% of the time, an equity portfolio will outperform a bond portfolio and give better outcomes. So, I mean, because these are typically 50-year time series, you know, it was pretty simplistic in the sense it was bonds versus equities rather than thinking about private equity and other things as well but 100 percent of the time equities outperform and provide better outcomes than bonds do and, and that's irrespective of the fact that markets you know can go down quite sharply at times i mean in 
0809 equity market went down about 40 percent but then i only need to show you the uh, long dated index linked guilt uh, chart of the last two years for you to know that you know frankly you'd be better investing in sort of african gold miners than the index linked guilt one final question is coming from Peter Cameron Brown. So I know it's the second time around, but it's a good one, Peter. Um, I'll ask it for you, if I may. Is there any minimum pot size requirement? Well, we haven't we haven't actually determined that yet, have we, Eddie? Um, but my thinking is lower the better, because all you're doing is paying people a pension. Uh, and why not help those people with small pots out? Um, Eddie, I don't know if you've got any thoughts on this. It's, it's something we discuss from time to time. Yes, I mean, sort of, um, you get that sort of trivial commutation limitation, whereby, um, you know, if you've only got a £10,000 pot, frankly, the administration costs will eat up returns. But um, certainly uh, the way we're looking at this is, is very much as a um, collective pension scheme. And... You know, most pension funds have got people with with relatively small pension entitlements. And just because you've got a thousand pound a year pension entitlement, you know, doesn't mean you shouldn't get your pension. The systems are all there with pretty low cost to actually administer pensions these days. Um, you know, 14 pounds a year or something like that. So as far as we're concerned, it, we should be open to uh, all comers. Um, Obviously, best advice if you've only got £100 is probably just to take it. Um, but uh, the systems are up and running to, to be able to take in big pots and small pots. On that happy note, uh, I'm going to ask uh, everyone to uh, put their hands together and thank the itinerant and peripatetic Edmund Trull uh, for his fine performance while on the train. Thank you very much indeed, Eddie. Um, well, thank you, everybody, very much from me as well, because really, really good questions. Um, what I love about these sort of sessions is that actually, by listening carefully to the questions, uh, we can um, improve the product, improve the products, plural, and hopefully provide better solutions. So uh, I'm very, very grateful to everybody for their time. Uh, and those who want to get in touch with me, and I can put you in touch with Eddie, so you can annoy him at your convenience. Right, um, Bo, over back uh, to Steve now, who's going to round off. I think you've got some news for us from you, Steve. Uh, yeah, um, just to say uh, thanks to Eddie again. Fantastic session. And we have first actuarial next week talking about DB liabilities and I think DB transfer update. So if you can join us next week, that'll be fantastic on the uh, pension playpen. Um, today's video will be up and running within about an hour or two from now onto the Pension Playpen site. And uh, as usual, we want to pray for peace in the East and peace in the Middle East, um, which I cannot believe we're still saying in February 2024. So uh, let's hope um, we get some, um, you know, positive news um, from those regions which are shockingly bad. Uh, and thanks everyone to joining today. If you love Playpen, please join. Uh, if you're already a member of Playpen, please share um, on the invites friend tab uh, and invite other friends and colleagues to join as well. Um, but uh, we really thank everybody's time today. Fantastic session. Thanks to Eddie. Thanks to Henry. And thank you for your input and questions. Uh, hope you enjoyed it. And um, hopefully we'll make the next one next week. So See thank you very much, everybody. And uh, be safe. Be safe. Yeah. OK, take care. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Cheers, Eddie. Thanks. Bye.